My name is Doug Hefley, Director of Safety, Risk, and Emergency Management at Eastern Municipal Water District, and I welcome you to the American Association of Water Distribution and Management's Thought Leadership Lab Video Module Series. In this video titled Organizational Risk Management, Gordon will focus on Family 4 of the 10 Families of Risk that was focused on in an earlier video. If you study enough tragedies in any high-risk occupation and look for the cause of the event, you will quickly see that there are thousands of proximate causes. The triggering event that instantly preceded the tragedy. But if you look for the root cause, it becomes very apparent that there are very limited number of things that are too often ignored and ultimately led to the given tragedy. This video introduces the five pillars of success. When the leadership of a water district focuses on getting and keeping good people, building good policy, assuring great initial and ongoing training, and providing adequate supervision, and having a viable discipline process in place to address employees who do not follow organizational policy, you will dramatically increase the probability of tasks, incidents, and events ending up going right, thus avoiding nasty consequences. Hello again, Gordon Graham here, and we are now on video number four of nine. Video one, what real risk management is all about. Video two, the 10 families of risk. Video three, that checklist I've been working on for 35 years, the five concurrent themes for success. And video four is family four of the 10 families of risk. Organizational risk management. Now again, Time to look at the graphic on your screen. On the right side of the graphic is the area I affectionately call Lawyerville. Lawyers will handle our tragedies after they occur. Lawyers can handle the deaths, the injuries, the embarrassments, the lawsuits, the internal investigations, and even the rare criminal filing. The lawyers handle tragedies, risk managers study tragedies, and we look for cause. And once again, the lawyers will tell you there are thousands of causes because all they understand is proximate cause. You walk up to a real risk manager and ask her the same question or him the same question. How do we get in trouble? There's not thousands. There are five root causational factors. Again, I have never done your job in water district operations, but I sure have studied your tragedies. You guys are an open book. And you can link those tragedies to these five root causational factors. Sometimes it's a lack of quality people. Sometimes it's a lack of quality policy. Sometimes it's a lack of quality training. Sometimes it's a lack of quality supervision. And sometimes it's a lack of or, uh, quality discipline. People, policy, training, supervision, and discipline. People, policy, training, supervision, and discipline. Can I give you the end of this video right now? You give me good people who've got good policy, constant ongoing training, supervisors behaving like supervisors, discipline when rules are not being followed, and you're going to avoid tragedy. But let's go all the way back to the top. People, policy, training, supervision, and discipline. Now, I'm a big fan of a theory known as analogs. 
if B is caused by A, let's fix A. So the problem, if the root causational factor is people, policy, training, supervision, and discipline, those become the analog. If that's the problem, they're also the solution. So when you have good people who have good policy, constant ongoing training, supervisors behaving like supervisors, discipline when rules aren't being followed, you're going to stay out of trouble. So let's start with the people component. And in a long program, and I've got an eight-hour program on this topic entitled, Not Everybody Belongs on the Water District Bus. You need a front door on the bus to screen out the obviously unfed. And you need a rear door on the bus to kick out the people who sneak on the front door. And I spend two hours on each of four topics, recruitment, backgrounds, probation, and performance evaluations. Now, as I've already alluded to, I am going to talk about background investigations and performance evaluations in a separate video. But that leaves two, recruitment. We hire from an applicant pool. If your applicant pool is an applicant puddle, that is a problem line in wait. And I can't speak for your organization, but if you've been reading the news recently, there is a shortage today, not of jobs, but a shortage of workers. And it's getting very, very difficult to find good people. For many organizations, the applicant pool is an applicant puddle. And that is a problem lying in wait. And I'll tell you what I've learned in life. Well, Gordon, the easiest way to increase the size of the applicant pool is to lower standards. Every time you lower standards to increase the size of the applicant pool, we pay for that five years downstream. You don't have to lower standards to increase the size of the applicant pool. Perhaps you need to revisit how you recruit. How do you recruit? Now, I know this varies because some of you are very small and some of you are very big. It really doesn't make any difference. If your pool is a puddle, that's a problem lying in wait. I have an idea for you on how to increase the size of the applicant pool. Make every employee a recruiter. If I was the GM, I would have this in the policy manual. While you're on duty, and make sure you word it very clearly, while you are at work, you are required to recruit. Let's think about the numbers. If everybody in your water district made it their goal to find one good woman, one good man in their career, that would help you keep up with attrition. If everybody in your organization made it their goal to find one good woman, one good man per year, you'd have a wide applicant pool. If everybody in your organization made it their goal to find one good woman, one good man per month, you'd have an applicant pool 12 times that size. I know I did that quickly. I went to Catholic school. If everybody in your organization made it their goal to find one good woman, one good man per day, you'd have that wide, broad, deep applicant pool where you can pick and choose among the best of the best and get what you need. Well, Gordy, what do you think we need in water district operations? Two things. Number one, top-notch people. And number two, top-notch people who look like your community. If you don't have both, you have got a problem lying in wait. The takeaway here is everybody needs to be a recruiter. Everybody needs to be a recruiter. And here I go again. This is not a class I teach. Well, he teaches the class. I wonder if he actually practices this stuff. Yes, I do. I'm very proud to tell you. I am the number one recruiter for the California Highway Patrol today. I'm very proud of that. And where do I recruit? I'm on airplanes a couple hundred times a year. You're sitting next to somebody, 21 to 35 years old, who sounds like a good person. They're reading a good book. They carry on a good conversation. Give them a recruitment pitch. 200 nights a year, I check into a hotel. You see that woman, and I had this happen to me, in normal Illinois, normal Illinois, I got to a Holiday Inn at midnight, and it's snowing outside, and I walked in, and here she is, standing behind the check-in counter with a big smile on her face at midnight. And you know what she says to me? You must be Gordon Graham. How'd you know that? How'd you know that? Well, I've got one more guest to check in, 
and you're the only one who hasn't checked in, so I'm assuming you're Gordon Graham. I am. That one little interchange, what's that tell you? She's smart. She's thinking in advance. So, Mr. Graham, the room we've given you is in a new wing of the hotel, and it's just been painted. I was up there earlier tonight. It doesn't smell at all of paint, but I left the air conditioner on to really get any possible smell of paint out of your room. Please turn the air conditioner off when you get in the room and turn the heater on. She's a thinker, and I'm looking at her desk. She's got books back there, marking pens. She's going to school. She's going to school during the day, and she's working all night. That's the future of my organization. And I gave her a recruitment pitch, and she said, you know, I've never really thought about law enforcement. I said, well, here's my card. Highway Patrol's always hiring. We're looking for good people. I think you'd be very good at what you, did, at what you do. She calls me a year later. Sir, I took your advice. I graduate the academy two months from now. Well, congratulations. Give me the date, and I'll make sure I'm at the graduation. And she said, sir, I, I didn't go to the CHP Academy. I went to Chicago PD's Academy. I joined Chicago PD. Is that good for me? It is. It improves the quality of the profession. Recruit not just for your water district, but recruit for the profession. Everybody needs to be a recruiter. After you recruit people, you've got that applicant pool. Now we've got to start narrowing it down through the background investigation process, and I will talk about that extensively. But i got to give you a hint. Spend your money on background investigations. Spend your money on backgrounds. Well, Gordon, they're very expensive. I'm a lawyer. Here's my throwdown statement. You can pay me now, or you can pay me later. And later is always a lot more so I teach a class on background investigations, and I'm going to cover it in greater detail later on, but this just popped into my head. I teach a class on backgrounds, and I got invited in for the first time 15 years ago to talk to a group called the California Background Investigators Association. And they invited me in for a four-hour talk, and I started off my talk with this. One dollar properly spent on a background can save you one million dollars in the future. One dollar can save you a million in the future. And half the people in the audience have been to my programs before. They've heard me. There goes Graham. Exaggeration, hyperbole. We know what you're trying to say. Backgrounds are important. But there's no way a dollar could save a million. Oh, excuse me. You don't think a dollar can save a million? And I would reach into my briefcase, and I would pull out a half a dozen settlements and verdicts that in excess of a million that could have been prevented if you would have spent one dollar on a background check. One dollar. Fifteen years later, she invited me back to address the same group. So I start off my program with this. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Gordon Graham here. I got you for four hours on the importance of background checks. Let's get started with this. One dollar properly spent on a background check today can save you one billion dollars in the future. A billion? No way. No way. That's like a thousand million. Uh huh. You don't believe me? Type this in any search engine. Annie Dukin. A N N I E D O O K H A N. You got nothing to do tonight. You're completely bored. This proves my point, and I'll beat it to death when we get into the videos on background investigations, but a dollar can save you a billion. Had they spent one dollar on a background check, they could have prevented a billion dollars worth of problems downstream. Backgrounds, more on that later in the video series. After we get our applicant pool, the recruitment, then we do our backgrounds, the third is the probationary process. Now, I know this varies from state to state and organization to organization. But if you have a probationary process for your new employees, remember this. Probation, as defined, is part of the hiring process. If you have women and men on your department, on probation, who can't or won't do the job, what do you need to do? Get rid of them. Get rid of them. They will not get better over time. Oh, they will. No, they won't. Oh, they will. No, they won't. This is not fine wine from Sonoma. This is wine in a box from uh, someplace else. You know, spend the time to take probation seriously. How do people get off probation? 
We let them off probation, and we know darn well they're a problem lying in wait. Or maybe I'm just being nuts today. Have you ever heard these words in your organization, in your building? How did he ever get off probation? How do people get off probation? We let them off probation. We know they're a problem lying in wait. And why do we ignore them? Because if we take them on, you get paid X. If you ignore them, you get paid X. So why take them on? Because that's your job. As a supervisor, as a manager, you've got to address probation. Don't let people fall through the cracks. It's part of the hiring process. If they can't or won't do the job, get rid of them. And finally, performance evaluations performance evaluations. I will make this recommendation in the long program on performance evaluations. Take them seriously or do away with them. I would rather have no process than to have a process which is being misused and abused. And quite frankly, jumping way ahead into the next videos, big hint, too many organizations overrate people. Overrate people. Why? Bias. We like our people. How do you honestly evaluate somebody you like? But that's not the real reason. The real reason we overrate people is it's easy. I got some GMs watching this video right now. Hey, GM, AGM, how many times have you had this happen in your career? Can I help you? I just got my performance evaluation from my supervisor, and you got to do something about this, ma'am. You got to do something about this. Once again, I've been overrated. How many times has that happened? Never. Nobody complains when they get overrated. If somebody thinks they got underrated, they're pounding on your door. They're pounding on your door, and then you call the supervisor in. I'm just hoping you can justify these ratings. Supervisors are not stupid. So where are we today? Well, you're not doing all that well, but uh, nobody else ever taking you on. Satisfactory. Well, you're not doing all that well, but I don't think management will support me if I take you on. Satisfactory. Just keep on overrating people. If you take people on, you get paid X. If you overrate people, you get paid X. Why should you take people on and honestly evaluate people? Because that's your job. More on that later. Good people, pillar one. Good policy, pillar two. Pillar two. The second of the five pillars of success is getting and keeping good policy. And I've already addressed this. I am hopeful that you've got well-designed policies that are kept up to date. Where I really start to worry, though, in this organizational risk management world is theme three. Theme three, training. I've already asked you one question. After you get hired, if you get off probation in your water district, when's the next time you got to take a serious test you have to study for? I think the answer is probably we don't. Let me ask you a second question. Let me ask you a second question. Have you ever attended a training day? put on by a water district organization where you didn't learn anything? Or worse, where you actually forgot things while you're in there? Let me ask you a third question. Does it appear to you that we're more concerned with people knowing things, or are we more concerned with having a piece of paper saying that everybody's been to a program? And let me ask you a fourth question. How do you really know what people really know about their core critical tasks prior to their involvement in the incident? And the truth is, we don't know. The first time we find out people don't know their core critical tasks is after the tragedy occurs, and it's too late. There's got to be a better way. That's the training component, pillar three of the five pillars of success, the foundation for my organizational risk management program. We have got to revisit training, and we've got to focus the training on the core critical tasks. Okay, Gordon, you've said this a dozen times. What's a core critical task? Well, take a look at the graphic on the screen. And if you've been to my programs before, you are very familiar with this graphic. Do not give me credit for inventing this. I did not. I learned about this in graduate school in 1975. And even then I had a question. Why, when the Highway Patrol hired me, did they not explain this chart to me? Why did I have to wait for a specialized course in university to learn something that everybody should know by the age of 18? What you've got in front of you is the risk frequency analysis. Everything you do in water district operations, scratch that, everything you do in life goes in one of these four boxes. One of these four boxes. 
Most of what you do goes in the bottom two boxes, low risk adventures, definition, if it goes bad, the consequences are small. Most of what you do go in the right two boxes, high frequency adventures, we do them all the time. Every now and then we get involved in the left two boxes, low frequency adventures, we do them rarely. And every now and then we get involved in the top two boxes, high risk adventures. Definition, if it goes bad, the consequences are big. So, of what value is this risk frequency matrix? If you understand this matrix, you can predict with deadly accuracy where mistakes are going to occur in any job description. Well, Gordon, where do mistakes occur? Well, to be quite frank with you, mistakes can and have occurred in each of these four boxes. But the proper question you need to ask is slightly modified. In any occupation, in any profession, in any job description, where are mistakes most likely to occur? And here's the answer, not in the right two boxes. Rarely do good people, and I assume you have good people, make mistakes on high frequency events. We've already covered this. You give me a good woman, a good man, and I believe you have them in your water district, and put them into a high frequency event, something they do a lot, our PDM kicks in. Remember that? Recognition prime decision making. Dr. Gary Klein, sources of power. The brain is that accumulation of past experiences, memory markers. And when the brain gets involved in something, it's done many times before, it doesn't have to think it through. It directs current behavior based on past successful behavior, and we stay out of trouble. Rarely do good people make mistakes on high frequency events. Rarely. Well, Gordon, you keep on saying rarely. Five exceptions. Check out your graphic on the left side. Complacency, fatigue, hubris, distractions, risk homeostasis. In a longer program, I would spend a ton of time on this, a ton of time. But just to fill in the blanks, complacency, I don't care how many times you've dealt with live power lines. The next time you deal with live power lines, it's as risky as the first time. I don't care how many times you've dealt with chemicals. The next time you deal with chemicals, it's as risky as the first time. I don't care how many times you shored up a trench. The next time you're doing trench shoring, it's as risky as the first time. The level of risk never changes. Acclimation to risk does change. When high-risk tasks become routine, that's a problem lying in wait. You've got to address complacency. Item number two, fatigue. I wonder... How many tragedies in water district operations are assigned approximate cause of X, but the real problem lying in wait is a grossly fatigued employee? If you are not getting, if you are not getting seven hours of uninterrupted sleep every night, you are suffering from fatigue. Oh, there's all sorts of fatigue. There's gross fatigue, there's petty fatigue, there's cumulative fatigue, there's long-term fatigue, there's short-term fatigue. I don't care what it is. Does fatigue impact decision making? Does fatigue impact judgment? Does fatigue impact coordination and balance? Does fatigue impact disposition? Does fatigue impact lifespan? The answer to all of the above is yes. We've got to address fatigue in the workplace. Fatigue is a big deal, and we're not even addressing it, folks. When I study tragedies and read the final reports, rarely do I see any, ask, any mention of this question. How many hours of sleep did the involved employee have in the prior four days? We've got to let people know the risk of fatigue. Distractions. Don't get distracted while you're doing high-risk tasks. Distractions. Distractions. Cell phones are a distraction. In-car computers are a distraction. I have to write a monthly piece for the New York Chiefs of Police magazine, and my monthly piece last month was on distractions in the workplace. The California Highway Patrol used to have motorcycle cops on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. Motorcycle cops on Sunset Boulevard were grossly overrepresented in rear-ending stop traffic. Motorcycle cops rear-ending cars that were stopped on Sunset Boulevard. They were distracted. Now, you think you know, but you don't. Well, Gordon, it had to be the beautiful women walking up and down the street. No, it was not. 
It was the plate glass windows on the storefronts where the motorcycle cops were able to look at themselves while they rode down the street. God, I look good. And they were rear-ending people. I am not making that up. Distractions. Don't let people get distracted while they're doing high-risk tasks. Hubris. I love confident personnel. Cocky personnel are a problem lying in wait. When people start thinking, I've been doing this job so long, nothing bad's going to happen to me. Something bad is going to happen. Don't be getting cocky. And finally, a fascinating phenomenon known as risk homeostasis. Risk homeostasis. Gordon, what's that all about? That's where we do things with the goal of making people more safe, but in reality, we make them less safe. Well, Gordon, that doesn't make sense. That's why it's a phenomenon. Talk to old firefighters, they'll tell you this. Gordon, your ears will tell you when you get out of a burning building. You could hear something, Chief? No, they got so darn hot, you had to leave. So firefighters' ears used to get so hot, they had to get out of the building. Well, we don't want firefighters getting their ears burned, so we gave them what? Hoods. So what do they do now? Go in deeper? Stay in longer? Buildings collapse on firefighters? Have hoods made firefighters more safe or less safe? We killed 19 firefighters in Arizona. Remember that one? Terrible, terrible tragedy. What was the big conversation after that? How can we improve the quality of the fire shelters? If you've been reading any of my stuff over the years, I've been railing against fire shelters for years. Canadian wildland firefighters don't carry fire shelters. Russian wildland firefighters don't carry fire shelters. Greek wildland firefighters don't carry fire shelters. Australian, New Zealand wildland firefighters don't carry fire shelters. All those countries teach their wildland people, if you see a fire, what do you need to do? Get out. Get out. Fire shelters. Have they made people more safe or less safe in the cop world? The CHP bought BMW bikes back in the 90s. It was the only bike you could buy with anti-lock brakes. You know, with better brakes, we'll avoid some crashes. Wrecks did not go down. They went up. They went up. Once my cops figured out they had better brakes, they started driving faster. Risk homeostasis. Huh. Training. Most of what you do, you're doing right, because most of what you do, you've done before. Address the fatigue, distractions, complacency, uh, homeostasis and hubris, and you can stay out of trouble. Rarely do we make mistakes on high-frequency events. Mistakes are more likely to occur on low-frequency events. And I don't worry about low-risk, low-frequency events, the bottom left box, because remember, the underlying task is low-risk. Even if it goes bad, the consequences are small. Where I worry for you, where I worry for me, where I worry for my wife, my kids, firefighters, cops, paramedics, doctors, lawyers, and water district personnel is in the top left box. When good people, and again, I believe you have them, get involved in high-risk, low-frequency events, they are much more likely to make an error. And that will be our topic in part two of this video presentation. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of minutes. Gordon Graham here, and thanks for coming back. We are on video four, part two, and we are talking about organizational risk management. A quick recap. There's the chart in front of you. On the right-hand side of the chart is the area I affectionately call Lawyerville. On the left-hand side of the chart is where risk managers play. Organizational risk management. Five root causational factors for our problems. People, policy, training, supervision, and discipline. Give me good people who have good policy, constant ongoing training, supervisors behaving like supervisors, and the importance of discipline. Things go right. We avoid the tragedies. We covered the people component. Recruitment, uh, backgrounds, probation, performance evaluations, and again, backgrounds and performance evaluations will be in our next video presentation, the one after this. We focused on recruitment. We've got to increase the size of our applicant pool. Applicant pool, applicant puddle, problem line, and wait. We talked very briefly about probation. You got men and women on probation who can't or won't do the job. Get rid of them. They will not get better over time. Policy, we talked about, I believe you have good policy, and I know, I know it's the goal of this organization to make sure you have good policies in place. Please make sure you got good policies, properly designed, kept up to date, fully implemented. Where I start to worry, though, is the training component. And we left off with the risk frequency analysis. And there it is, miraculously, on the screen in front of you. 
Rarely do we make mistakes in the right two boxes. Things a lot, we do a lot, we tend to do very well. Mistakes made in the bottom two boxes are essentially inconsequential. They are low risk. Where I worry is in the top left box. High risk, low frequency events. Now I'm slowing down. In any occupation, in any profession, people are much more likely to make mistakes in the top left box than any place else. Now to be fair, not every mistake is going to end up in a tragedy. But if you make enough mistakes, sooner or later, all the holes in the Swiss cheese get lined up. We're going to have the tragedy. I worry about the high risk, low frequency events. Any occupation, any profession, pick a story out of the news. About five, six years ago, as we filmed this, Asiana 214. Remember that? San Francisco International Airport, the 777 coming in from China, missed the runway by about 50 feet, broke in half, people ended up dead. I read the final report. How many hours of flight time did the pilot have in a 777? I think the number was 43, of which 30 were in a simulator. That's 13. 13 hours of flight time? How long was the flight he was on from Asia? 13 hours? He was high risk, no frequency. By the way, if you know the story, people ended up dying on that plane crash. How'd they die? Firefighters ran them over. Anybody think they did it on purpose? Nope. Those firefighters were playing in the top left box. High risk, low frequency. Not one of them had been involved in a commercial airplane crash before in their career. High risk, low frequency. Speaking of firefighters, who dies fighting wildland fires? Overrepresented are municipal seasonals and volunteers. Why? For a career United States Forest Service firefighter, fighting a wildland fire is high risk, high frequency. Top right box. They do it all the time. They got the memory markers, the behavioral scripts, the experience. Who dies every year? Municipal seasonals and volunteers. Think I'm picking on them? Give me a smoke jumper from the Forest Service, put them in a high rise fire downtown, they're going to get in trouble. High risk, low frequency. High risk, low frequency. When I was a brand new cop, they gave me a revolver. 15 years into my career, they took the revolver away and gave me a semi automatic pistol. Every big police department around America that transitions from wheel guns to semi automatic pistols in the first year, they have a higher number of what? unintentional discharges because for a while you're playing in the top left box high risk low frequency you give your people a new truck with a higher center of gravity for a while that's high risk low frequency you give them a new chainsaw for a while it's high risk low frequency you know stay out of that top left box mrs graham loves going to scotland our daughter did her graduate work in St. Andrews University in Scotland. And we used to go over and visit her regularly. So one night, me and Mrs. Graham are watching TV, Wheel of Fortune, and the prize puzzle is a trip to Scotland. And here comes the tears, here comes the tears. Poor Sarah, she's over there all by herself, and we haven't seen her in almost two weeks. I think I'll fly over there tomorrow and visit her. Well, nothing like them great deals you get on last minute international air travel. Sweetheart, I won't be able to go. I'm working tomorrow. That's okay. I know how to get there. How are you going to get there? Same way we always do. I'll fly United into Edinburgh, and I'll get a Hertz car, and I'll drive up to St. Andrews. Sweetheart, how many times have we been over there? I don't know, maybe 20. Have you ever seen me rent a Hertz car? No, you always hire off-duty cops to do all the driving while we're in Europe. Yes! This is not a class I teach. It's a way of life. The second you leave the Hertz lot, are you playing in the top left box? You are driving on the wrong side of the road. And for those of you who think it's not that big a deal, not until you come to a roundabout. A roundabout every day a U.S. citizen is getting in trouble in a roundabout. Why? It's high risk, low frequency. By the way, when the Brits come over here, they get in trouble. They step off the curb looking which way? To the right. And our cars come to the left. It's all risk and frequency. High risk, low frequency events scare me. So, your take back to work assignment is you need to identify in every job description in your water district, every job, front desk, admin, clerical, billing, accounting, uh, maintenance, every job description, you got to identify 
what are those high-risk, low-frequency events? Well, Gordon, you're not going to tell us? I don't know. I've never done your job. Well, Gordon, how can we find out? Remember that basic risk management rule number two that I gave you in video one. Rule two, remember that? The errors you're going to make can be predicted from the errors already made. The errors you're going to make can be predicted from the errors already made. That was a mistake, so I'm going to do a repeat. Three, two, one. Go back to that very first videotape we did. And I gave you, at the end of that video, I gave you the three basic rules of risk management. Rule one, there's no new ways to get in trouble. If you want to identify the task, the specific tasks in every job description in your water district that end up in that top left box, all you need to do is study your past tragedies. The errors you're going to make can be predicted from the errors already made. There's no new ways to get in trouble. If you want to find out how front desk people are going to get in trouble, all you need to do is study how they already been in trouble. If you want to know how chemists are going to get in trouble, all you need to do is study how chemists have already been in trouble. Study your past tragedies. Well, Gordy, we've never had an employee at our front desk get in trouble. Just because it hasn't happened to you doesn't mean it hasn't happened in other water districts. Study similar, similar situated organizations. Organizations like you and ask the same question. And that, that is the huge benefit of be becoming a member of AWDAM or being a member of AWDAM. They've got data from around America on all these water districts. Ask them in this job description, how do people end up downstream in trouble? That top left box. Well, Gordon, you can't tell us what they are. Can you tell us how many there are? Yeah, 5%. If I had to hazard a guess, only 5% of what your people do falls in that top left box. 95% of what your people do is either high frequency or low risk. The top left box is 5%. Well, Gordon, assuming we do 1,000 things, that means there's 50 in the top left box. Yep, about 50. Gordon, that's still a pretty big number. That's why you need to prioritize them. When I first saw the chart, it's exactly what it looks like on your screen now, 1975. In 1980, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for the rest of my life, I divided the top left box in the two areas. See how it's split now? DT and NDT, where the DT stands for discretionary time. I've got time to think before I act. And the NDT stands for non-discretionary time. There's no time to think. I have to act immediately. That top left corner of that top left box, those are the core critical tasks that I keep on talking about. Those are the ones that scare me the most. Those are the ones that need the constant ongoing training. Please, the third of the five pillars of success. I have no beef with the initial training supplied by your water district when you hire people. My complaint is the ongoing training. And I want to narrow it down and focus the training on the events that have the highest probability in every job of getting us in big trouble. The core critical tasks, the red shaded area, high risk, low frequency, non-discretionary time. What Richard Riscola was doing there for all the employees of Morgan Stanley was preparing them for a core critical task. What that flight attendant does every day when I'm on an airplane is preparing me for a core critical task. What I do every night when I check into a hotel, going to the emergency exits, that's preparing me for a core critical task. I've been very fortunate over the years. And over the years, the decades, people have given me awards for my work. The award I'm most proud of is an award I got from Governor Pete Wilson in 1995 for Excellence in California Law Enforcement for a program I learned about in 1975 in graduate school in 1975. And in 1975, I'm a motorcycle cop. I've got no gravitas, no credibility, just a motorcycle cop. I came up with a better way to train people based on something I learned in graduate school, a better way to train. And I told the CHP about it, and they laughed at me. And I don't blame them. I'm just an idiot motorcycle cop. What did I learn in 1975? Remember, I was at the ISSM, the Institute of Safety and Systems Management, and I was the non-military person in the class. 
We had all these guest lecturers coming in talking about military safety. We had one guy coming in talking about submarine safety. And he started talking about submarine fires. Apparently, if you're on a submarine and there's a fire, that's a really big deal. And if you don't get the fire put out really quick, everybody on the submarine is going to die. So the Navy, they're always thinking. They identified and evaluated a risk. They put together a control measure. And the control measure is every day, every submariner is trained on what? Firefighting. Firefighting. Do you know that most submariners will go through their entire career without having an onboard boat fire? They still train every day. This guy wouldn't shut up. He started talking about undersea collisions. Apparently, if you're on a submarine and you're driving like under the ocean and everything and you run into a mountain, that's a really big deal. You rip the front end off your submarine, that's a really big deal. So the Navy, they're always thinking. They're always thinking. If you don't get the hatch secured really quick and the buoyancy properly adjust throughout the entire boat, that boat's going to creep to a little crush depth and everybody's going to die. So what the Navy do? Every day, every submariner is trained on what? Damage control, response to undersea collisions. Why? Most submariners go through their entire career without having an undersea collision. Why do they keep on training? On my recommended reading list is a great book by Amanda Ripley entitled The Unthinkable. She sums it up very nicely. These unthinkable events, these things that just don't happen here, do they have a nasty habit of popping up every now and then? Got nothing to do tonight? Type this in to any search engine. USS San Francisco, January 8, 2005, the San Francisco, a Los Angeles class nuke, is making a speed run from Guam to Brisbane, Australia, got off course, and at flank speed, it slammed into a seamount. That would be a violent event. Flank speed into a seamount, 500 feet below the level of the sea, collapsed the front end of the San Francisco. 137 sailors on the sub that night. How many should be dead? All of them. How many died? One guy got crushed. A machinist mate got crushed on the initial collision. He was working up in the bow. 136 survived. They had zero memory markers created by frequency. They had a ton of memory markers created by the constant ongoing training. Every day we need to train. And it was that program that I built into the CHP way back in the 80s. And that's what the governor gave me the award for. Every day a training day. I've built a company where every day is a training day for police and fire. What I'm trying to get you in the water districts to do is make every day a training day. Well, Gordon, I used to watch Chips. Did you really? The greatest TV show ever. And you guys sat around in a circle for hours talking to each other. You don't know the way we work in the water district. We don't have a daily briefing. We just get in our truck. We just get to our desk. We just start our job. We don't have time for daily training. Really? At some time during the day, do all of your people have to log on? I bet you most of all of your people have got to log on. For the life of me, I can't figure this one out. When people log on at the start of the day, why is it the first thing on their screen, a training bulletin specific to a core critical task and followed up with a test question? Every day, training and testing on core critical tasks. Again, back to our focus, organizational risk management, the five pillars of success. Good people, I believe you have. Good policy, I'm pretty sure you have. But don't forget to talk to the people at Audam. They can help you out. Training, every day we need to train and focus it on the core critical tasks. The supervision component, I will beat to death in a later video. But the last of these five pillars of success is the discipline component. And I've already touched on it. Discipline is not a function of consequence. All is well that ends well. Well, did anybody get hurt? Nope. Did any property get destroyed? Nope. All is well that ends well. You can have an event end up A-OK, -okay, in which there's major violations of safety rules. Trench shoring. I keep on talking about trench shoring because so many construction workers die in trench operations. Well, yeah, we didn't properly have it shored up, but nobody got hurt. All is well that ends well. Just because it ended up OK does not mean we can ignore it. You cannot rely on luck. You have to rely on process. And when people don't follow process, it needs to be addressed notwithstanding outcome. 
Discipline, if it's going to work, needs to be prompt, consistent, fair, and impartial. Discipline is never a function of consequence. It's a function of process, a function of policy. When people don't follow rules, it needs to be addressed. Discipline is a discretionary time task. Take the time, slow down, slow down, take the time to think it through. If possible, contact HR, contact personnel, ask them how to handle it. You just can't fire people. In most states, there's a procedural due process. Please take it seriously. Discipline is very important. People make mistakes, they need retraining. When people cross the bright line of ethics and integrity, maybe it's time to get rid of them. So there you have it, folks. People, policy, training, supervision, and discipline. And let me wrap up this videotape with six questions. Question one, then why do most things go right? Because you've got good people and you're putting them in high-frequency tasks. RPDM kicks in, things go right, we avoid tragedies. Question two, then why do things go wrong? Two reasons, somebody did something bad on purpose or somebody made a mistake. The intentional misconduct can be attacked if we do a better job at getting and keeping good people. Recruitment, backgrounds, probation, performance evaluations, a little more on that later. The mistakes can be taken care of if we did a better job at training. Which brings us to question three, how do we train? Training has got to be more than having a piece of paper saying that somebody went to a class one time, in time, some time ago. If training is going to work, it's got to be focused on the core critical tasks, and every day has got to be a training day. The fourth of these five pillars of success is we've got to get supervisors behaving like supervisors, more on that later, and discipline when rules aren't being followed. People, policy, training, supervision, and discipline, the five pillars of success, the principles of organizational risk management. And that wraps it up for video number four of nine. I look forward to seeing you in number five when we're going to talk about two topics, the background investigations and performance evaluations. Until then, work safely. We thank Gordon Graham for his deliberative, comprehensive, and interlinking risk management video series. Adam would also like to thank the California Association of Mutual Water Companies, Appalachian State University, and our charter members for their support in producing these videos. We welcome you to visit Adam's website at www.aawdm.org for more details on the association's mission, initiatives, and services. The Adam video module series is available to all public water systems, related entities, and supporting stakeholders. Utilization of any aspect of this video without the express written permission of ADAM is strictly prohibited. As with any presentation, the opinions associated with this subject matter are those of the speaker and not of ADAM, its members or supporters. Thank you.